Hey, everybody. Yep, we're here playing on the Edge Radio. I'm Dr. Pat. I get to do this fabulous show. This is Megan Edge's show, Playing on the Edge Radio with Megan Edge, Radical Change with Ease. Uh, and Megan, this is a fascinating topic for today. It is a fascinating topic, and I'm really excited to dive in with you and start sharing some of our ideas that we've been discussing over the last couple of weeks about what it means to not heal. Yeah. Yeah. So today's episode is on the edge of not healing. What that, look, have you ever been there? I, I'm just curious from our audience. Have you ever been there? I have on the edge? So been there. Oh my gosh. So, so many times. <laughs> let's talk about it. You know, it, it's, mm. it's, I think it's important to talk about healing so that we can really talk about not healing. Right. That's um, right. Are they opposites of each other or not that simple? It is not that simple. There is a whole psychology to healing and a whole psychology to illness. There's a, there's a lot that's been written about the power of the mind and our ability to overcome by simply changing our thoughts. And there's lots of evidence to suggest that that's true. But when somebody is full on in a healing crisis, that idea that we could heal ourselves simply through our thoughts really flies in the face of what it is that they're experiencing in that moment. And it's, it can happen where we, end, we get caught up in the belief that we just can't heal whatever this is. We've either been told it's chronic and we believe that, or we're in such pain and discomfort that the, the idea of being well again is so foreign to us in that moment that it can be really difficult to dig ourselves out of a deep hole of feeling ill. And that's what we're going to be talking about today is what, what is that? What, what does it mean to heal? What is that in the first place? Yeah. When we talk about well-being and healing. What is that? And then is it okay to not heal? Yeah. And I think that's the question because we live in a society where um, we actually don't come out and say it's okay to not heal. However, I must say that if, if you're following anything that's going on in the uh, the debates that's going on between the Democrats, there is actually this same conversation going on. And they don't quite put it like this, mm -hmm. but they do put it very succinctly and very clearly that, you know, there's a population group that literally can get a prescription from the doctor and actually not have the money to heal. And so right. I wonder what happens when you're in the mode where healing is not an obvious choice for you. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like sometimes we're bombarded by social norms. Like you get a diagnosis and you hear about the diagnosis and somebody tells you, well, you know, this diagnosis, you got a one in five million, right? Mm -hmm. The psychology of that would say that you either put your hands over your ears and go la 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 like that. Yeah. Or something happens to give you a belief. So I'd love for you to talk about the, the behind behind the scenes idea about healing and what we need to acknowledge in order to get to full health. So there's a couple of points that you've made that I want to make sure that I that I address. And the one that really stood out for me is, can you afford to heal? What if you don't have the money to heal? Can we break that down? Can we take a few minutes to break that down? Yeah. Because yeah. in that statement is already a belief that healing and health costs money. That's right. That it's expensive to be well and to stay well. And I would like to dispel that myth. I know that the way our modern medical system is set up, both in Canada and the US, and the way that our beliefs are set up, there is a lot of evidence that would suggest that that's true. You know, and that old saying, money can't buy you happiness. Well, it sure as hell can make it easier yeah. <laughs> when yeah. all of your needs are met. But then I would question, what are your needs in the first place? And are you giving over your potential to be well to somebody else who's holding the purse strings, who's deciding how much that pill or that treatment 
or those protocols are going to cost you or cost your insurance company. What if you could educate yourself around simple, easy, practical and accessible ways of feeling better, even if it's not the cure for whatever it is that ails you? So I think that that's a really important thing to, yeah. to, to address in this is this yeah. idea that it, it costs money to be well and many, many people can't afford it. It's true that many, many people who are below the poverty line don't have access. Even people who are middle class don't necessarily have access to very expensive treatments. There are alternatives. Yeah. There are alternatives. And then the other point that you brought up is around this idea of what does it mean to be healthy in the first place? Yeah. What's yeah. my definition of being well, my definition of I'm having a good day in my health and your definition of you're having a good day in your health. If somebody's really, really sick, getting up by themselves and standing may be a good day, right? Exactly. And, and somebody who fi figures out they can finally climb Mount Everest, that's their best day. Yeah. I want to ask you this question about um, this notion of societal impact that persuades us that healing won't happen unless we buy something, mm -hmm. unless we have the right ad, right thing that the advertisement's projecting on TV. And I've right. often wondered this question, and I've asked this question a lot, especially to people like Dr. Darvish. How have we survived as a species? Mm -hmm. So this is the question I ask. Right. How did we make it? Right. Mm -hmm. It goes thousands, thousands of years. How did we make it as a species? You know, what was it that we learned about healing and living? Right. Right. That maybe we've forgotten today. I think we've forgotten a lot. I think in the last few generations, we've given our own sense of control over our bodies, our own knowledge of our bodies over to a system of medicine that does its very best with what it has yeah. on hand and yep. the constraints that it's under. Yep. But that unfortunately for the last few generations has had a very narrow view of what the body actually is as a mechanical object and how it is that that body can be healed. I think what we have had in the past and in other cultures besides sort of North American culture is a concept of a holistic approach to being well. That includes community. That includes our, our mind. It includes not just looking at the physical body, but looking at the emotional body and the energetic body, looking at the source of an illness or an injury, coming from someplace perhaps beyond a pathogen or a cancer cell you know, exploding or an injury, looking to the source of the illness and the injury in the first place. Yeah. You know, I don't know about you, but I, I can remember my folks from, what do we say, the old country? <laughs> <laughs> from the old country. Okay. And I have to tell you, I don't remember a lot of doc doctors until I was older, mm -hmm. but I do remember um, a, a lot of stories of illness, right? Mm -hmm. But from that, especially for me, I cried for like four years, they said, there seemed to be this remedy, this toolkit, or mm -hmm. this grandma's remedy for stuff, right? right? And I remember this like it's yesterday. Now, fast forward to where we are today, and purified concentrated oregano oil, mm -hmm. like that's the bomb now, right? right? For a lot of people. Yes. But grandma somehow, <laughs> somehow knew that if you take whatever grandpa was growing and you threw it in olive oil, and I don't know what else she did with it, yeah. it became a thing. That's so, right. But I want to ask you this. Grandmas believed in healing. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. They had a sense of, yeah, this is possible. Have we lost hope of healing? Oh, I don't think we've lost hope of healing. I think that's actually what drives the pharmaceutical industry and synthetic medicines. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's the hope of healing. Uh, I mean, okay. <laughs> Maybe not entirely. Certainly there's a bottom line financially right. to, to right. all of that. 
Right. But what what drives somebody to take that pill, to accept that prescription, to accept that diagnosis is that hope of of healing on on a on a level, on some level. But part of what we're also going to be talking about today as we go through our episode is why would somebody not yeah. want to heal, choose to heal or apparently cannot heal? And what is the psychology around that and that relationship that we have between our bodies wanting to be well, because I think that's how our bodies are born. They want to be balanced. They want to be healthy because that's what's going to take us through this life in the best way possible. When we're out of balance, then that's when we set ourselves up for illness and injury. When you're talking about that oil of oregano, we're talking about plant medicine. We're talking about the things that used to be at our fingertips. They still can be. You could grow a herb garden on your balcony in downtown New York. Right. And you could have fresh basil, fresh oregano, fresh rosemary, fresh sage. All of these are medicine. These are kitchen medicines. And they are as potent and as powerful, especially if they're distilled into an essential oil. And even more potent than some of the synthetic medicines that are no longer working for us. Yeah. And, you know, it's fascinating that we're talking about this because you and I both, you know, we have a history. And I, I want people to know for a minute Mm -hmm. about why this is important for you. You know, this is not something where you just picked up a book and you thought, oh, I think I'll do a show on this. <laughs> you know, this is a journey for you. You got some history around stuff, right? I got some history. <laughs> uh, I've often felt that <laughs> coming into this physical body was a real challenge for me. <laughs> I know. But this may not be my natural form. Well, I want to talk about, let's take a short break, because when we come back, I want you to share that. Mm -hmm. Because when someone has gone through as many things as you've gone through, mm -hmm. it is not unusual that you would be the one to be talking with and helping other people get through this. And I mean, wounding at all levels. Yeah. all levels. When we come back, I want to talk with you about how does one's life, how does one journey, how does that walk us through the psychology of illness? And what should we know about that, especially if you've got some things that have come up in your past that perhaps are calling to be healed? Let's take a short break. Megan Edge, we're talking about, yep, on the edge of not healing. We're also taking your questions, 1-800-930-2819. Do you have a question about this? Give us a call. We'll be right back. Yeah, there we go. Thank you, the Benny. healing power of music. Thank you, Benny. Thank you. Play, playing my girl. So good. Stevie. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That's good medicine right there. That's what I want to be when I grow up. Stevie <laughs> Nicks. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Megan Edge. Megan Edge is in the house. I, Megan, I want to do a couple of things before we talk about this. First of all, you're talking about this because you actually do work with people and help them. And you've got a number of things they should know about. First of all, they should know about the heart's journey right? The Healing uh, Hearts Oracle Cards, right? And the guidebook. Yes. Uh, then the, let's give them your, your website and then any events you have coming up. So people can find out about the work I do, see lots of videos and trainings that I've done, workshops that I've done, our radio show, all kinds of resources through my website, which is at meganedge.ca. That's .ca, not .com, meganedge.ca. I also have a number of different groups, support groups on Facebook, including our most recent one, which is called The Essentials Roundtable with Megan Edge and Susan Seal. This is a public open group for anybody who's interested in looking at the use of natural medicines, especially and specifically plant medicines and essential oils to help support your health and well-being. And where else am I? Oh, LinkedIn. <laughs> uh, LinkedIn, Island Women Magazine, Mind Body Network. Um, gosh, I feel like I'm, a, I'm in a lot of places. <laughs> yeah, you are. Uh, I'm in a lot of places. Yeah. Because I want people to have yeah. this information and this knowledge. And it's all on your website too, it's right? It's all on my website. Okay. That's right. Yeah, yeah. It's absolutely all on my website. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and of course you can reach out to Megan directly. Uh, if you've please got any do. questions, yeah, really, please. I think that's important. Send me an email. I'm old fashioned apparently. 
I really <laughs> love emails and it's a much better way to get a hold of me than leaving a message on social media because I don't always see them or get them. Right. And a little note, a little side note, a little rabbit hole. I don't own any of my messages on social media. Social media owns them. But when you email me, it's a little closer to home and I can keep better track of our conversation. So email me at Megan at MeganEdge.ca. Yeah, that is true about social media. Yeah. Um, you know, we're talking about uh, today, what we're talking about here is we're talking about on the edge of not healing. And before the break, what I said was, look, you know, this is not a topic that you're passionate about because you just woke up one day and said, wow, I have nothing better to do. You know, let me let me talk about a healing journey right. uh, or your healing work. You know, you went through uh, your own battles, right? Your own demons to mm -hmm. get here. And so I'd love for you to share a little bit about what that was like for you to go through the range of, of events that occur around healing and what the effects are and what we call in the, psycho the psychology of healing. Yes, absolutely. Or actually the psychology of illness. Psychology of illness. Well, and also the psychology of healing. Yeah, both. Yeah, I think that there's both there. My, my journey around uh, pain and chronic illness and conditions and syndromes and symptoms ranges from surgeries to uh, full body embodiments of fibromyalgia, of Marfan syndrome, which is a connective tissue disorder. There's heart, uh, heart valve issues as well in, in my body and my system. I've had 17 surgeries in my life, Pat. Wow. And well, when I look at that list of surgeries, they seem different, like they seem not related. Well, of course they're related because they're all in one body, right? So my toe surgery is actually related to my throat surgery. And my bowel surgery is related to the belly birth I, I had with my second, um, my second daughter. Mm -hmm. I was five years old when I had my first surgery. I wow. had an appendix removed. Um, I've had eight inches of my bowel removed for a prolapse bowel. I've had my tonsils taken out as an adult. I've had so many surgeries that seem to be disseparate, but they're really not. And the underlying cause of almost every injury, illness, or disease is inflammation. This is what medical science has determined now, which makes perfect sense because when our body's inflamed, it's in pain. And I remember being told when, or when I was told by the naturopath that she thought I had fibromyalgia, she said, go home and look it up. So I went home and I looked it up and there was this list of all of these things. And I checked off every single one of them. And I cried from relief because I had something now that I could work with. That's always been my approach to any, any illness or injury or surgery that I've had to have. I've always wanted to understand why. How does it benefit me? What is the reason for it showing up? Why have I called it into my life? How can I heal it? And I can't heal it unless I understand what it is or where it's coming from. Right. Right. And, I, and when I was given that diagnosis of fibromyalgia, the people around me were very upset for me on my behalf. What a horrible, awful thing you're going to have to live with for the rest of your life. No kidding. And I said, no, <laughs> no, you tell me that and I'm going to find a way out. You tell me it's chronic and I'm going to look for every way that it isn't. Oh boy. Because I don't believe that. I, that's, a mind, that's a mindset. Yeah. That's a mindset. I know what it's like to be in such chronic pain after my second daughter was born. I could not get up off the sofa. I felt like the least healthy 95-year-old woman on the planet. And I was 36. <laughs> and it was shortly after that that after having gone to see doctor after doctor after doctor after doctor, I'm sure there's a lot of people in our audience who can relate to this. Oh, no kidding. And being told it was all in my head, being told yeah. none of it was connected, being told yeah. it was IBS, blah, blah, blah. The whole list went on. Oh my God, it does go on. Right? I was yeah. all of that. And it's exhausting. It's actually very exhausting to be ill. It's a full-time job to be chronically ill. And we desperately want to be better. That's, that's that hope piece. Why do we go from doctor to doctor to doctor? Because we don't want to be in pain. It's very addictive to not be in pain. <laughs> right? yeah. So when that diagnosis came through for me and I, and I celebrated my, for myself, then I started to do my research. Well, what do we think causes it? And this was, well, my daughter's about to be 15. So this was 15 years ago. 
that I had this diagnosis. And it was so simple. It was so simple. In my case, it was taking gluten out of my diet. And it was literally a miracle healing. I already thought I'd taken gluten out of my diet because my yeah. daughter is was born with anaphylaxis and full-blown life-threatening allergies. That's another part of my healing journey is, you know, how yeah. do I help her? So I thought I'd taken gluten out of my diet, but it's everywhere. And I didn't realize how much of it I was still ingesting. Yeah, I, I did am, the same thing. Yeah, I did the same thing. But don't you think we've evolved sort of like... Um, uh, I, your time frame, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it sounds like this has been a lifetime journey for you. So it doesn't surprise me about the work that you do. 50 years, right? 50 years I, of doing this. <laughs> oh my God. It doesn't surprise me, but, but, yeah. but it's so relevant to today. I mean, mine started in 2004 and I had never been sick in my life really to speak mm -hmm. of. I mean, what tonsils, the flu or something, you know, like that, mm -hmm. or at least I thought I wasn't sick. I now know differently what was going on. Right. But then 2004, I had shoulder surgery in uh, Halloween of 03. And it literally was a trick or treat. Mm. And thank God my shoulder is working today. But six months after that, and I understand why m my immune system literally stopped working. Um, but I didn't have you to talk with. And I think that's Aww. the, that's the thing <laughs> though, but see, this is the yeah. gift of taking the message out there. Right. I don't think I'm alone. I think there are many people, but they don't know who to go to. Now I have to tell you, it was shortly thereafter. The angel lady had a, had an angel tell her to tell me where to go. Mm. And I got to Dr. Darvish and right. we both went on this journey together yeah. of, but how many people don't have a resource? And mm. don't you think that that, that contributes somehow to not healing? Absolutely. It does. When a person believes that there is no hope or there is no help and they don't right. know how to help themselves because no one's ever taught them that they don't have that empowerment within them, then it feels hopeless. Yeah. It really does feel hopeless. Yeah. And that's not a great place to be. That will knock out your immune system faster than anything else. I was wondering about that. I was, I was going to ask you if you could talk about the relationship to those emotions, because that's what you talk about as well. you yeah. you, you and I have talked about the various ranges of emotions, but now what we're talking about is an emotional hit that could actually trigger something in the body to really go just wacko. Absolutely. When, when our emotions are low, our whole system is low. Our immune system is low. Our central nervous system isn't working properly. We are a Petri, bit, petri dish for more disease to, to come into our bodies and into our systems. And when we're, when we're feeling that despair and that hopelessness and we're in pain, it, it takes us out. I am not here to suggest that it is an easy thing to go from a chronic condition or even an immediate condition, like an, like an injury or car crash or sudden, something that suddenly shows up for you to go from that to saying, okay, well, I'm just going to be better now. And I'm all better now. It actually is a journey. And I, I believe that if a person is willing to open their mind to the possibility that there is a silver lining, that there is an opportunity within that illness or that injury to look at their life differently and from a different perspective, to search out help that they might not have otherwise asked for, and to be open to allowing other people in on that journey, then the healing can happen to whatever is the best healing for them in that moment. And sometimes that journey isn't about being better mm -hmm. without any pain or any discomfort. I have pain and discomfort almost every day. I get very stiff. Things, things hurt. <laughs> My brain gets foggy. That's the fibromyalgia. <laughs> I often forget that's what's going on and I wonder what's wrong. And then I remember, oh yeah, I have this thing. Oh, I know. I do the same thing. <laughs> I'm like, what the heck? And then I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. 
But the thing is, I want it to matter. I want it to mean something. I don't want it to define me. I don't want to show up somewhere with my fibromyalgia or my Marfan's leading the way. I don't want to introduce myself with that because that isn't the totality of who I am. These are things that in this lifetime are what I have chosen, I believe, to participate in for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is that if I understand what pain is and I can demonstrate ways of being better within that, then could I help someone else? Could I be the catalyst or the mentor or the coach to suggest how they may also be able to experience less pain? Yeah. And I want to I want to talk about that when we come back from break and we'll probably skip the next break because this next piece is the piece that you just referenced. Mm -hmm. It's the piece of empowerment through crisis of illness, through illness of any kind. You know, it's empowerment through the illness of others that are going through it. When we come back, Megan's going to talk about, well, wait a minute. What happens when we look into the big picture? Yeah, that and much more. Stay tuned, everybody. We'll be right back. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Welcome back. Uh, Megan Edge. Yep. Playing on the edge. Uh, Megan, before we just jump into this, um, and I have a really weird thought that I have to share, but uh, can you, again, give folks your website and let them know what you've got going on? meganedge.ca. That's that's so simple, straightforward. That's where you'll find me. And then from there, links to all the other places where I am online, including our YouTube channel, our new show on essential oils and using essential oils for health and well-being. It's called the Essentials Roundtable with Megan Edge and Susan Seal. And man, do we ever have fun. Holy cow. We are laughing <laughs> so much when we're doing that show because, not because the oils are funny, but <laughs> But because the way in which we interact with one another is just, it's very funny. It's hilarious. It it is. It's really fun. And the one that we just aired on Monday is called The Sexy Show. And it's looking at essential oils to help with our hormone support and balance with our libido, with supporting intimacy, just in time for Valentine's Day. Benny, we got to bring sexy back, don't you think? (laughs) <laughs> oh, of course we do of course we do tell him betty oh, i love that sexy. justin timberlake song um <laughs> that was well i think it's almost one of my favorites um but the fu- here's a funny story and then we're going to get right into this right mm-hmm. okay so two things i'm doing one is i'm going to be doing a show that dr darvish and i talked about i hit radio i well it's i health radio mm-hmm. it's part of the i hit channel Okay. And it's called I Hit I Health Radio, and I sh- I've shared a little story with her because I'm also an advocate for Lyme disease and Lyme disease awareness. Mm-hmm. And so I got a bunch of people want me to bring Lyme talk back. So the dilemma is for Jessica to figure out a way to brand all of the different shows I'm doing now. Mm-hmm. But I get an email. This is not funny, but it is funny. So I just got to tell everybody. Please laugh and you don't have to email me on this. <laughs> but I get an email from somebody who said, Hey, Dr. Pat, did you watch the Oscars? And I said, Yeah, kind of. I yeah, I watched the winning at the end. They said, Oh my God, can you believe that a movie about Lyme disease won the award? And I thought, well, wait a minute, I didn't get that. And so I emailed her back and I said, okay, I totally missed who was the movie that one. She said, yeah, the director and the movie, uh, they're from South Korea and they won the award. And I said, I emailed her back and I said, Parasite is not about Lyme disease, (laughs) but I wish it were. And I thought... (laughs) I thought, wow, that, you know, because we don't pay attention to like, is the movie from Korea, but this is a level of awareness now we have about right. Lyme disease that we didn't mm-hmm. have in 2004 and five. Yeah. And so all joking aside about that movie, which I understand is a great movie, right? Mm-hmm. We have elevated the level of awareness about healing and things that are going on in our body and illness way beyond 
what my parents could do because they didn't have the tools and the information. And that really leads to the next thing for us to talk about. Mm -hmm. And when we think about the big picture, we must include what we're going to do with free will and the information age. It's so interesting. One of the things that I've said numerous times is how fortunate I feel that I get to live where I live and when I live, because I have access to healing tools that my mother didn't have access to, my grandmother didn't have access to. They may have had old world wisdom, sort of, but we're talking you know, mid 19th century or mid 20th century. We're talking the 1940s to the year 2000 when my mother died. And she was brought up with the belief that the doctor is God. Doctor knows everything. She didn't know how to stand up for herself. She died a really unpleasant death from a lot of complications from Crohn's and colitis and various other inflammatory diseases. Mm. She had so many more, I think she had more surgeries than I did actually. Wow. She shouldn't have died. If, if I knew then what I know now, I know she would still be alive. And not that I feel like I should have saved her. I don't mean to have a savior complex about that. I know that that wasn't the journey, the road, whatever. But what I know is that there's a lot of unnecessary illness and death that happens because we have been denied the natural knowledge that I feel so grateful to be able to have access to. And I mean, we're talking about these essential oils, for example. Yeah. I can buy them. I sell them to other people. Like that's part of my business is working with these oils that are completely accessible. Nobody tells me I can't, they're not illegal. Right. And they're not just for smelling good. They have medicine and there's a lot of research that's being done that that demonstrates that and it's really timely when we look at the coronavirus or or the mars virus or anything else that's going what my father died of the ards basically these are the superbugs that our synthetic antibiotics no longer can touch right because the viruses are alive and some say they're intelligent and they're working their way around these synthetic medications i want to have choice in how I keep myself well and healthy. And I'm fortunate that I have that. I mean, I feel like that's the free will piece. Yeah. But I know that still, even though modern medicine is not very old, I mean, as a discipline, it's maybe 200 years old, 150. And even then it's really only within the last 50, 60 years that it has such a hold. And that, that has to do with the drug companies. And it's unfortunate, but that's true. So these natural medicines, these, these choices that we could have, not to replace some of the medications or the treatments or the protocols of modern medicine, but to bridge the gap, but to bridge, to build bridges between the two of them. Yeah. Right. To support our well-being from day to day so that when we get the crisis, when we have that health wake up call, we have choices about how it is that we're going to look at what's happening to us. Right. What our belief system is around that, how we're going to be in it. Are we going to be a victim? Are we going to decide it has meaning and importance? Are we just going to let ourselves have the experience of it? All of all are valid, but it's that it's that having choice. It's having that free will around what do we do when we're in that state. But don't you think now though, and we, the, our listeners were, didn't hear what we were talking about during the break. We were talking about essential oils and I was asking Megan about them because you know, I just, uh, I just received my kit. And so I was talking about them. And I asked a very specific question about coughing and so forth. And I got a very quick answer. And what I love about this is the idea of free will, that I could actually buy the oils from you. Right. And now I have to get educated about but in lieu of me reading about it, I will ask the question. And Mm -hmm. here's what I want to say about what we're talking about. I did some research way back when Dr. Darvish was treating me. And by the way, Dr. Darvish still treats me. I'm getting ready to go in for a big tune up. And, you know, once upon a time, I read about this. And the idea of science and holistic or natural or whatever one wants to call it, Mm -hmm. it dates back as far as, and I read this about an ancient tribe, about them standing out in a field waiting for lightning to activate a certain oil. Mm -hmm. 
And I was reading this story and, and, and I thought, well, that makes sense to me. I see what they were doing, but I don't know if it actually worked. Mm -hmm. And you read stories about this. And lo and behold, where are we today? Well, where we are today is we're sitting down, we're hooking up some kind of electromagnetic machine, little pads to our knees, to our neck, maybe massage. We're doing that, right? And we're putting oil on and we're activating that. And so what I'm trying to say is the mission really is to bring back all these things that actually worked. Yes. And I love that you use the word mission because that is what it feels like for me. Yeah. And ever since I decided to become a healer as my work, capital W, having always been that kind of person to look out for the underdog, to help people when I could with what I knew. Yep. When I said, this is how I'm going to make my living is to be of service in this kind of way. It is a mission. How many people can I get in front of to remind them of what they already know? Yeah. But they've forgotten. They just don't remember it. Or they've got blocks up, whatever. I mean, I'm not here to convince anybody of anything, but I sure would love the opportunity to demonstrate through my own experiences, through the science. There's there's a lot of science around the world that supports natural healing, plant medicine, plant medicine is where our medicine comes from. Don't be right. fooled. Don't think that big pharma isn't out in the Amazon right now looking for the next plant that has medicine for us that can be synthesized and turned into something that can go out to the mass market. Right? Yeah, I'd be out there. Uh, if I'm right? them, I, I, I'm <laughs> out there. From. I mean, <laughs> I, I'm looking. I'm really looking to see what can be done and how it can be done. And I, and I think that we're all the better for it. But mm-hmm. the thing that I, I think I want to really get back to is we have free will. Yes. And sometimes before we feel empowered, we have to take that step before and make a decision that we're going to actually do something on our exactly. own behalf. Exactly. Whatever that looks like. Whatever that looks like. And that's that's the point around free will around illness. It, you actually get to decide. You have this incredible mind. And the beautiful thing about your mind is that you can change it at any time. And no one can stop you. It's your mind. So if you've been told by doctors that your cancer is is chronic and you're going to be dead in three months. If you're told that your arthritis is, you're going to be on medication for the rest of your life. If you've been told that your depression is now yours for the rest of your life and you have to be on psychotropic drugs, I'm not telling you don't continue with the protocols that your doctor has given you, but I would really encourage you to start questioning, is this true? Is this my life sentence? Or can I, through my free will and free choice and empowerment, we have the internet for Pete's sakes. Now, I know there's a lot of conflicting information out there, but it's a place to start. It is. It is. find out what choices do you have. And speaking from someone who's been in chronic pain, who's on, has, I've been on pain medication many times, because quite frankly, the body heals faster when it's not in pain. That's true. It's and people know, don't know. Known. That is a no. That's a no. <laughs> that's body, a scientific the, fact. <laughs> The body right. cannot heal when you cannot sleep. That's right. So what can you do to help yourself sleep? And I know that that desperation. For me, there's always been that curiosity. And, and maybe that's the first step for a lot of people who've spent decades in chronic conditions. Just let yourself get curious about what else may be possible for you that your doctor, bless him or her, maybe they're doing the best they can. Most of the time they are but they may just not know. And before deciding that anything that isn't mainstream medicine is woohooey and suspect, recognize that everything in mainstream medicine has come from the woohooey world originally, the plant medicines, um, the minerals that are out there, our vitamins, all of that. And, And get yourself informed. Like where you're talking, Pat, about you love to do research. You love to learn and to understand. I do. No, everybody can do that. Yeah. We are, again, we're so fortunate that we live in a culture and a climate where that's still available to us. 
Yeah. Do our own research. You can read what I love to research now is because people ask me about this. They say you're sharing a lot of information. Do you get it from what are reliable sources? I am like, I'm like the 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 geek of research because Mm -hmm. I love finding these articles that are now being studied. They're academic articles, they're published articles, and they're talking about things like stress. And they're talking about things like massage and they're taught they're, they're talking about them. And as a matter of fact, I was listening very sidebar and the news came on right for a moment this morning. And this, there's a study like a real study, a scientific study that was done by a group over here, control group and another group. The one group did not get walnuts. And the other group got walnuts and they did this study on the power of memory and walnuts. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, who did that? It's brilliant. Yeah. But we don't have the money, generally speaking, to do that. So people have to count on you and on me and on Dr. Darvish and others sharing stories about what's worked. That's very true. And and I'm I'm comfortable and confident standing in a position of authority for what I know to be true. And I am always learning myself. I'm always researching. I'm always looking for more yeah. information. I'm on PubMed. I'm looking at the science studies. If yeah, I'm talking I about too. the essential oils, I'm there looking for the research that's being done on these constituents, on these plant medicines. Absolutely. At the same time, that, that like to bring it back to that psychology of illness, I'm also really curious about what's happening up here in our minds around the why of being ill. You know, we were, lo- we were looking at the bigger picture. There's a, there's a, for me, there's a responsibility piece. Yeah. It's my body, it's my illness. If I have gotten sick, I wanna understand why, not as a karmic thing, not like this is punishment for something I've done in a past life or in this lifetime. I want to understand the pathology of it and I want to understand the emotions of it. And <laughs> this funny story, I was, I used to get sick all the time. I had a pattern of being ill, usually around Christmas time and April, May. And then for university, I was in university for about five years. That was my pattern. And in high school too, right? <laughs> Always would get sick and I'd get sick. I had walking pneumonia. I had strep throat. I had mono, you name it. I didn't just get a cold. I was full on. And I was visiting my father at Christmas time and I had this full on cold or whatever it was, pneumonia. And I'm going in with him. I'm talking to him all about the reasons why. Well, obviously my body needs to rest. And, you know, at a bigger picture thinking, maybe there's something I'm not saying. And so my throat's closing up. You know, I did this whole psychoanalysis yeah. of why I was sick. And my father puts down his spatula he was cooking at the time. And he looks at me and he says, Megan, sometimes a cold is just a cold. Oh, (laughs) but no, it's true. (laughs) But, but if you come from the place where it was never just that, that's right. You know, that, that, then you come to a different conclusion. And I wish a cold could just be a cold for me, but even all these years later, 30 years later, if I start to get a tickle in the back of my throat, I'm going into my own self-analysis all right, where am I working too hard? What am I not saying? Where is it showing up in my body, the pains and aches? Because our body has a language. And where things show up in our body, if you know the language of your body, that can be information about what that emotional and energetic source is of that that's showing up for you. Yeah. I've often said that the greatest gift I've ever gotten on my healing journey was the fact that none of the doctors for about a year could figure out what the mystery disease was. And I often say that for that year, I was undiagnosed, but diagnosed, Mm -hmm. but it allowed me to say, if you're not going to find out, I'm going to start to do some research on my own. And one thing led to the other. Um, And one day I was talking to the angel lady about it and it led me to another place because I hadn't settled in on a name. Right. And the bucket that I was put in kept changing, mm-hmm. kept changing. 
It yeah. went from you're, you belong in the HIV bucket. No, 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 that's not right. It's the MS bucket. Okay, then it's not that bucket. It's over here in this bucket. Mm -hmm. And I remember that and I went through tests. They tested my brain. They hooked me up to, what do you call those electromagnetic things? Yeah. They did all of that. And I remember the tipping point for me was after thousands of dollars, I went to one doctor and pain all over my body. I, my system was out of control. And he said, you know what the cause of all this is? You have sleep apnea. And that's when I said, I have got to get a real opinion here. <laughs> That may have been true, but <laughs> that may have been true. It could but, have been a contributing factor. <laughs> come on, folks. Yeah. yeah. Well, but you look. know, as, as you're telling that journey, I'm, yeah. I'm the thing that comes to my mind just as we're coming to the close of our time yes. is that yes. you, didn't, you didn't go on that journey by yourself. I didn't. And this is the thing about illness that I would like to leave our listeners with. Illness is not a single journey. It's not just about you. It's also about the dynamic between you as the ill person and the people around you. And I don't just mean the doctors and physicians, I mean your family members, I mean your spouse. Critical illness or injury can make or break a relationship. It can bring people together, it can also tear them apart. That journey is a shared journey. And sometimes the cure isn't to get healthy. Sometimes the journey is to be in the illness in order to have your own experience of it, but also so the people around you can have their experience of it. And so when one wants to get well, we sometimes have to step out of the dynamic we've created for ourselves within that community or that family and, and shift the need of everyone coming together or everyone falling apart. That piece of the journey becomes the responsibility of the person who is in the epicenter of it. But it does have a ripple effect and it does impact everybody around us. And I know that illness and pain can be very isolating because no one else knows what you're going through. They can't feel it. Right. But they are a part of it. Right. There's, there's an impact there. And so the healing journey is actually for everybody. Not only right. the person who is ill, but mm. for everybody around them. Wow. Megan they Edge. Part of that journey. Megan, thank you so much. Thank you for today. Thank I want to thank God. everybody out there for tuning us in, turning us on. Please go ahead, go to MeganEdge.ca. If you want to find out more about Megan, for me, just go to the Dr. Pat Show. Thank you, Betty. Thank you, Jessica. What thank a great show, time. Megan. Thank you. That was great. We'll talk wow. soon. Wow. Yeah, thank you. And Linda, <laughs> can't wait till Linda, you get back here, boy. We got some experimentation to do. We do All indeed. Right. All yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everyone. See you next time.